So we are indeed in study in the book of the prophet Isaiah, but we are in session three, which we're going to explore two key chapters, chapter six and chapter seven. And uh, for those that are just joining us, I'll mention a few remarks. The word Isaiah means yod heh is uh, salvation. Yahweh, however you want to pronounce the unpronounceable name, but it means it's salvation, which is interesting. One of the things in this particular exploration is the text we're going to lean on. And one of the things we're going to afford a glimpse of as we go is the new International Standard Version Bible. It's just being in the process of being released. And uh, the, it's, its primary text, it, it's very unique in that it takes as the primary text the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, as its base text. And the, the Masoretic text, the Septuagint and others are compared as variants. So it's unique that it puts the, the, the DSS ahead of all the others. And we have the benefit here of a proprietary translation from the Paleo-Hebrew into English by Dr. Peter Flynn himself, who's the acknowledged expert on the Great Scroll, and also Dr. William Welty. And uh, we also have uh, the proprietary translation by Dr. Flynn. But the Septuagint, which of course was the quotes in Christ's day, and we're going to find out that Matthew quotes the verses we're interested in from the Septuagint. And I'm grateful for that, because they repair some other, some other misconceptions, fortunately. And then, of course, the Masoretic text. These are the primary references we use in the International Standard Version Bible. But now Isaiah is quite a guy. He was the son of a guy by the name of Amos, not the prophet Amos, a different guy. But he, uh, but he may have been of, of royal family, by the way. But he certainly a family of rank. He had access to the king, we discovered in chapter 7. He was intimate with the high priest in chapter 8. Uh, Jerusalem was his home. In fact, he served as the court preacher. He's the first prophet to be in an official office with the king. Prior to this, prophets were to a particular person, you know, like, like uh, Nathan and others, but to David and so on. But here is, he's actually had an official uh, role here. He was a martyr, it turns out. Apparently, the tradition is that King uh, Manasseh uh, cut him in half with a wooden saw, and that's recorded in a couple of places as a tradition. It may be alluded to in Hebrews 11 also. A couple of interesting things when you want to measure a writer is his vocabulary. And if you go through Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and all the psalmists put together, none of them have a vocabulary equal to Isaiah's. He's an incredibly eloquent person. Now, we, we're dealing with translations, so we miss all of that. But I think it's important for us to understand that. When you study English literature, you know that Milton, Dante, and Shakespeare are well known for having the largest vocabularies recorded in the English language. Well, he, so Isaiah ranks in that way, if you will, within the Hebrew culture. And so he's the most comprehensive of all the prophets. And his themes span from creation, uh, the original creation, to the creation of a new heavens and new earth. The span of his horizon here is broader than any of them. No other prophet matches his majestic eloquence on the glory of God. He has ways of expressing that that go far beyond the others. All the nations of the world are included. It's not just Israel. All the nations are in view here. And uh, no other prophet is more focused on the redemptive work of the Messiah than, than, and, and, and aware of grace. So especially coming at this from the New Testament perspective, we're going to see the roots of everything we hold dear deeply in Isaiah here. So in fact, as we look at this book, we're going to discover it is full of primary notable elements. The vision of the throne of God in chapter 6 we'll look at tonight. Uh, the virgin birth is center in our thing tonight. Uh, then, of course, the Messianic Revelation in 9. Lucifer's Rebellion is chronicled in verse, chapter 14. There's even allusions that maybe have something to do with the Great Pyramid in chapter 19. John the Baptist is announced in chapter 40. The suffering death of the Messiah. Suffering and the death. Many people are shocked that the death of the Messiah is all detailed here. And uh, it's quoted by Christ in his mandate at Nazareth. When he starts his ministry, he gets his mandate from Isaiah 61. And then, of course, we have the millennium and beyond that. Most of what we know about the millennium doesn't come from Revelation 20. It comes from Isaiah 65 and 66. So this is an incredible book that we're undertaking here. If we just listed the messianic prophecies alone, his deity, eternity, pre-existence, all of those things, his incarnation, his youth at Nazareth, anointed as a servant of the Lord, chosen, delighted in, and so forth, mild-mannered, his, his uh, kind, ministering of kindness, his obedience, all these things are emphasized by Isaiah, his message, of course, his miracles, and it uh, goes on and on, his sufferings. His gathering to us, uh, exaltation, his rejection by Israel is laid out in Isaiah 53 more thoroughly than you can find anywhere else in the Bible. 
shame, struck, and bruised in Isaiah 53, his vicarious death on our behalf, his burial, his resurrection, it's all laid out here. And his ascension and his spiritual progeny, the disciples, his high priestly ministry is alluded to, his future glory is detailed in, in eloquence that isn't matched anywhere else. So it's an exciting book. And so he's the greatest, that's why we can say he's the greatest of the writing prophets. He ministered during the reigns of four different kings, a period that included the invasion of the northern kingdom by Assyria. And we're going to look at that, not so much for history, but as a metaphor of the future. And that may surprise many, and we'll take a look at that as we go. We'll also discover some interesting things, that all calendars on the planet Earth apparently changed in 701 BC. And there's some provocative possibilities as to why we'll get at that there then. So the chronology, of course, we, he... When Uzziah dies is when chapter 6 will focus on his ministry. And uh, he, through Jotham and then through Ahaz, who's a loser, and we'll see him in some strange uh, uh, perspectives today, tonight. Then into Hezekiah. And, uh, and uh, we believe that uh, Isaiah outlived Hezekiah. It was his successor, Manasseh, that apparently was the one that martyred him. Isaiah, we think it's after Hezekiah died that Isaiah penned the last 27 chapters, which are so prominent in our, from our New Testament perspective. And of course, the tradition that he was cut in half and so on. And so he, the last dated event is in the 14th year of Hezekiah in 701 BC, where the calendars change, and we'll deal with that when we get there. And so, okay. As we go with Isaiah, we're going to try not to get too tangled up in the local politics. I'll try to highlight enough of that so we have a perspective of what's going on. But our interest really derives from the fact that much of what's going on has a broader relevance than the local situation they're facing there. God called a special people to represent him. Here it's Israel, and with us it's the church. They had become apostate and failed. And many people feel that the church in the Laodicean age is doing the same thing. The enemies of God are represented here by Assyria initially and Babylon later. And we begin to realize those are metaphors for the enemies of God in a broader sense. And it gives us a clue as what is this mystery of Babylon thing in the Revelation all about. And God's judgment and the ultimate res uh, restoration are depicted. Yes, there's judgment, but always with the promise that a remnant will survive. And there's, what's going to be surprising to us is how relevant this book is to you and me today. Not just because of our interest in the Bible or interest in history. No, no, no. It has relevance today. That's going to shock you and surprise you and, uh, as we go. So be with us. Now let's keep in mind the overall design of the book. And uh, we'll, we'll treat it in three sections. Two primary, first and third being the big ones. Division one is the first 35 chapters. And we are in the middle of that. And I won't get into the details here. You can have that in your notes and, and look at how, how that goes. The second division is a parenthetical historical insert. And there are four chapters that... Uh, uh, correspond with Second uh, Kings 18 and Second Chronicles 32. In fact, the King's passage may have been written by Isaiah himself. It's almost word by word by word. The same as this. And 36 is about Hezekiah's trouble, the king at the time, Hezekiah's prayer, and his illness, and finally his folly. He does a f foolish thing at the end. But those four chapters are inserted before we get to the climax, which is Division Three, the third division of this book, and uh, that's the last uh, 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 chapters from chapter 40 to. Uh, we had to 48, we have the purpose of peace from 49 to 57, the prince of peace, guess who? And the next is 50, from 58 to 66, the program of peace. What's interesting about this, at the very center of division three is chapter 53. And it's the holy of holies of the Old Testament in the minds of many commentators. It's interesting that it literally is in the center of the third section. And uh, 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 it's, uh, it's an incredible piece. And it, it's both preceded and closed by there is no peace and Yodivave to the wicked. So it's a very interesting design. And so we've been previously up till now, we've been through the first five chapters, right? Chapter one was the first session. Last time we had chapters two through five. We skimmed through those. And the general theme here was from judgment to salvation. But now we're in chapter six is where we're headed. And uh, we're going to see here a major change in the affairs of the children of Israel. And uh, they had relative prosperity up to Uzziah, but it wanes now from Uzziah and onward. It's going to go downhill because they are going to be in a terrible decline. And it's my tentative uh, perception that there may be a parallel here that we can see in our world today. 
in general, both Europe and America, and especially America, are on the threshold of a decline that may be very parallel to what we're seeing here. So let's keep our uh, attention on that. So let's just jump in now into chapter 6, verse 1. And our primary text, of course, is the King James Version and will remain so. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah speaking, he says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So uh, this is a a, a verse that has a lot of commentary because many scholars don't feel that it's the temple that we think of as the temple in Jerusalem. There's an ambiguity here that is the scholars argue about. Was it just the literal temple in Jerusalem? Possibly. It's a vision that we're dealing with. Or was he transported literally to the real throne of God? And that's my leaning for a lot of reasons. But just understand that there, there's good scholars that debate that issue here. And so the King Uzziah, and uh, that's, he's called Azariah in some other passages. Don't let that confuse you. And uh, his train filled the temple. Now this requires a little, when you think of his train, it's like his robe. And what it really is pointing to, strangely, is the hem of that robe. And I'll show you why here in a minute. The word shul is an unused root meaning to hang down, a robe or hem. And uh, in Ruth chapter 3, verse 9, um, we have Ruth beg Boaz to ha- throw his skirt over her. That's not, she's not propositioning him like a prostitute. She's asking him to marry him, give him her, her protection. And that all is developed in our commentary there. But it's important to understand that because the, the whole idea of hems are... And incidentally, Isaiah said, I saw also the Lord. That's a disturbing verse to many because we see all kinds of verses in the scripture which says that man cannot see, right? And they're listed in your, in your uh, uh, workbook there. You can check them out on your own. And yet, in some sense, he apparently did. You know, exactly what that included or didn't. There's a point. Obviously, theologians can argue about that. But he says he saw the Lord, whatever that means. And uh, did he see a representation of God? Or there, there, you, can, you can wrestle that, if you like, as you go. And so, uh, according to John 12.41, it was Christ who appeared to him. So that may soften that issue for people who have a theological issue. It was Christ that he saw. Whether you realize it here or not, John illuminates that for us in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 41, if you want to track that down. And so, uh, now... Uh, The ISV, just to give you a quick snapshot of how it treats this, and we'll be looking at the ISV as we go because in some places it's helpful and we'll also in some places that it needs some correction. Uh, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne high and exalted. The train of his robe filled the temple. So that's great. Nothing, I think that's the flavor we get from the King James, so I don't think there's any contribution here. But I want you to understand a little bit about hymns before we go on. Rank in the ancient cultures was viewed on the hem of a garment. We think of rank on a sleeve of a pilot or an admiral or something, or on the shoulder. In their culture, the rank was embroidered on the hem of the garment. And uh, it often held the genealogy or some special role they had. A contract could be approved by pressing the hem into the clay tablet as a signature and so forth. A divorce could be accomplished by ripping off the hem of the bride. The hem was considered authoritative, an emblem of authority, if you will, you see. And so we, we, uh, David removed Saul's hem in 1 Samuel 24. He later regretted that he did that. But when he found he was in, Saul was sleeping in the cave that he was hiding in, he, to prove he could have killed Saul, he, he, t- he took off the, the, the hem of his robe. The next day he waved it from the top of the hill, proved that he could have killed it. And he made his point, but later regretted it because he did, in a sense, injure the, the king's uh, authority there. The fringes on the Levitical garments is alluded all through the Torah, and we could go through that. Uh, in God's covenant with Israel, in Ezekiel, God says of Israel, I will spread my skirt over you. See, that's God saying, I'll put my authority, my protection over you. See, I want you to get the flavor of what that word train means there. This is God's way of expressing his covering, his protection over the house of Israel. You remember the woman with the issue of blood uh, in Matthew 14 or Mark 6 or Luke 8. She shows up, she sought the hem she pushed through the crowd to get the touch. She felt if she could just touch the hem, she would be healed. And you know, you can check out the story. But again, it may be just in her conception, but that's okay. She f- saw his authority somehow represented by his hem is the idea. Okay, so let's go to, the, we, we made it all the way to verse 2, okay? 
Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, and the, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So he's got six wings. The first embarrassment here for the King James translators is seraphims. The word seraphim is plural already. A masculine Hebrew noun with an im ending is a plural. So you don't need the s there, but that's a, that's a slip up, if you will, strangely enough, in the, uh, uh, so it's a redundant, if you will. But clearly what we, the seraphim are clearly some kind of God's attendant angels. And uh, the, uh, we find the word seraphim in Numbers 21 means the, uh, the fiery serpents, which means they're not winged, they're just rapidly moving. The, the seraph, the word seraph, the root means flame, but it may not be flame like heat necessarily, it's flame like being active. And that's what, and that's what those that's what were. And so uh, the serpents that bit the Israelites, they're back in Numbers 21. And so uh, uh, the term seems to imply burning from seraph, which means to burn, but it can be burned like zeal, not necessarily flames, you see. Um, dazzling brightness is what the suggestion is, and there are lots of verses on that. But being uh, uh, the rapidity with which they are in the service of God, is the, that's what characterizes the seraphim. They have six wings and one face. Now that differs from another group we encounter in the scripture called the cherubim. Again, a plural, because the I am ending. But the cherubim had four wings. Those that were in the temple embroidery, they only had two there. Um, and uh, they had four faces. And uh, in fact, those four faces turn out to be significant. Uh, it's interesting when you get to the book of Revelation, in chapter 4, there are four living creatures that we generally regard as equivalent to the cherubim. Um, and uh, they also had six wings, though, like the seraphim did. So as you, as you try to study what are cherubim, seraphim, and there's a third group, the Ophanim, and I'll come to those in a minute. We can try, by looking at all the places they show, to come to some conclusions. But let me tell you candidly, it's not, cl it's not clear. Some scholars think they're just other names for the same creatures. I don't think so, because they have some distinctive differences. But the seraphim, are, are, they have six wings in Isaiah, and also if, if they, they may be the things referred to in Revelation 4. And uh, the, the cherubim have, uh, have uh, four wings in Ezekiel 1. Uh, the, 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 the cherubim have four faces in Ezekiel and in Ezekiel 10. In the camp of Israel, we see the camp of Israel, the four camps have ensigns with the same four faces as the four cherubim have. So that tells us something fundamental structurally is indicated there. We discover the design of the Gospels was recognized by the early church as representing those same four faces. And so when you study the architecture of the Gospels, we always go into that. I don't want to get into it here, but you can check our materials on that if you like. The, the, the four faces in the camp of Israel, the four faces in the, the uh, design of the Gospels, and the four faces that will show up in the cherubim, not the seraphim. So I'm just trying to, to alert you to those differences. When we look at the ISV, there's nothing new here. The seraphim stood above him, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, and with two he was flying. Now I think that's in hyperspace, so that raises a whole other question of what we mean by wings, but I won't get into that here. We're dealing here though with what I'm going to call throne room angels. We have the cherubim in Ezekiel 1 and 10 and Revelation 4. We have the seraphim in Isaiah 6 only, unless the Isaiah, Isaiah, Revelation 4 may be seraphim, some people think so. There's another one that you miss called the ophanim, which are wheels, translated in Ezekiel 1 and 10. But there are also angelic beings somehow associated with the throne of God. So if you want to get into a study there, one, you can just get a concordance and take these three words in the Hebrew or the Greek and chase them down and see what you can conclude. And it's an interesting, but, uh, but not, not conclusive in my mind. The cherubim are mentioned in, in, uh, in Genesis 3. And of course, they are going to prominent in Ezekiel 28 because Lucifer was one of the cherubs. He was the, he was the cherub in charge, apparently. And as we're going to run into that in Isaiah 14 when we get there. We'll go through all that there. And God is sometimes referred to as the one who dwelleth between the cherubim, because there were two cherubim hovering over the, uh, in the gold, over the throne, the, 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 uh, the mercy seat. And uh, there's a whole study on the mercy seat that I encourage you to dig into when you have the occasion to do that. But now we get to verse 3. We'll make some progress here. Isaiah 6 verse 3, and one, he's talking about the seraphim now, one cried unto another. In other words, among themselves they are singing apparently, antiphonally. One cried unto the other and said, holy, 
Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So uh, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, holy, holy, holy. What does that suggest to you right off the bat? Anyone? The Trinity. The Trinity. Now that's, you can't make doctrine on that. If you either see it or you don't. I see it that way. Some people don't. That's fine. I think it's a reference to the Trinity. In the ISV, it says, They kept on calling each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of the heavenly armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. So that sounds fine, but that doesn't add anything for me. Let's move on. Verse 4. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, different scholars have different views. Some say that this implies that it really was the temple in Jerusalem. Not necessarily. Clearly, there's an impact here that's going on wherever they are. And uh, fine, we'll move on here. The ISV says, The foundations of the thresholds quaked at the sound of those who kept calling out, and the temple was filled with smoke. Fair enough. And uh, then said I, this is Isaiah talking, Then said I, Woe is me! For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Wow. Okay, that's Isaiah's declaration. I personally have no problem with that in the King James. I think it goes on pretty well. He says, uh, earlier he said, I saw. Okay, remember I mentioned that. Because that itself it creates some dispute among some people's eyes. Well, let's see what the ISV says here. How terrible, how terrible it will be for me, I cried, because I am ruined. I am a man with unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of heavenly ar- the heavenly armies. Um, that's okay, I guess. I still, I, between, candidly, I still kind of like the force. I may be just a victim of the King James. I think there's a majesty there. Woe is me is more than its implication on me alone. I think that's a stronger term in my mind, but let's just move on here. Verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims, there is the S again, but anyway, Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Now here's a priestly service of some kind being administered by the seraphim, because this is a way of of cleansing his lips, so to speak, if you will. So, and uh, and we find references to that in Revelation 8 and uh, and uh, Exodus 1 and 10 and so forth. The fire never goes out, we know from Leviticus 6. So we're t- it's as if he took the coal, not from the brazen altar out front, but from the altar of incense, which is right there in the holy place, if you will. Well, the uh, ISV, t- the one of the seraphim flew unto me, carrying a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough, let's move on. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. That doesn't mean he was uh, burned by it, that he's disfigured or anything. It's a, it's a ceremonial thing, but he is, that's, that's, that was the way it was uh, the, the, his deep sense of unfitness uh, and is, when this, is what this seraphim is dealing with. And uh, so uh, this is the fire that God had, for, had kindled, according to Leviticus 9 uh, 24. He laid it on Isaiah's mouth, saying, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and the iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Okay, so it's a, a uh, uh, ritual procedure done by the seraphim that's analogous to what the high priest would do, interestingly enough. Okay, let's see what the, uh, let's see what the results of the decision. As he says, he touched my mouth and said, Look, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sins atoned for. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm not sure that's what, exactly what it says, but we'll move on. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who shall go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Now that's a great verse. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Are you hearing that voice? Some of you out here may be hearing an equivalent in your life. Your life is uh, being reached by the the Lord asking you that very thing. Whom shall I send? Who will go for I like the us, by the way. Do you pick up that? That sound like a plural to you? It does to me. Then said I. Isaiah says, Then said I, Here am I, send me. That's the, you pray about that. And see if you can, in your prayer closet before the Lord, raise your hand. Say, Lord, here am I, send me. I like that. Isaiah 6, 8. That's a challenge there for us. And I love that us. You see, I see the Trinity again, but then I'm... A, I'm one of these crackpots. Let's move on. 
The ISV says, Then I heard a voice of the Lord as he was asking, Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? Here am I, I replied, send me. Okay, nothing new there, we'll just go on. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. That's kind of strange, isn't it? You know what's really strange? Is this verse and the next one are quoted six times in the scripture for the calling of an apostle, what have you. He says, go and tell this people. Okay, great. And they're going to really accept it. They're going to be, no. Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. This is Isaiah's new commission. And these two verses, this one and the one that's going to follow here in a minute, are given, were given to Matthew in Matthew 13, given to Mark in Mark 4, given to Luke in Luke 8, given to John in John 12. Okay, they're the four evangels, as we sometimes call them, the four gospel writers. Oh, and there's Paul in Acts 28. These two strange verses from Isaiah are given to each of these six. Interesting. What on earth are they saying here? Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Is the ISV helpful here? He says, go, we surrounded, tell us people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. In other words, it, put, it emphasized the present tense of both of them. Okay, that's useful. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. What on earth is going on with Isaiah 6, 9, and 10? Go and spread the word, but they're not going to convert. That's what it's telling me. Is there an inversion here? Am I missed? Is, is, it a, is, it, is, there, is there an ellipsis here of some kind? These same two verses, 9 and 10, are given to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul as instructions. Now, SV is an info. It says, dull the mind of this people, deafen their ears, and blind their eyes. By doing so, they won't see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, understand with their minds, turn back and be healed. It's as if God is removing their excuse. Interesting. Is that possible? I'll leave it to you to pray that through. See, in John, let's take the one case. I won't take all six of them. Let's just pick John in John chapter 12 again. The way he quotes this there, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. See, John 12, 40 is a terrifying threat to the unbeliever. Tie that to 2 Thessalonians 2 and some other passages. It's quoting Isaiah 6.10. So there's another lesson here, especially from John. The first point is they would not believe, we find out from John 12.37, though they had seen evidence of his designed sonship. That's why. Secondly, they could not believe because their hearts became hard and their eyes blind. That's verse 39 of John 40. And finally, God said, they should not believe because they had spurned His grace. Wow! This is one of those applications to a calling that doesn't guarantee that your calling is going to bear the fruit you think it's going to be. It may be a means of removing any excuse. You're going to be divisive. You're going to, if, you're, if you're doing the Lord's work, you'll be divisive. Heavens forbid, huh? we work so hard not to be divisive. Well, there's a place for that, and there's a place that's a failure. You need to declare. And uh, Isaiah 53 is going to deal with that head on, by the way. He's going to talk about Israel's unbelief. And uh, Isaiah 6.10, the hardness of heart. And uh, so, this states that God blinds the eyes and hardens the hearts of those who persist in rejecting Christ. If you've been called to Christ and you persist in refusing that, you have picked a path that's going to get hardened. Your ability to return is going to be denied in some form or another, apparently. Okay. And uh, so it's recorded, that reported, recorded seven times in the New Testament. Strange word. It is a repeated warning that reminds the unsaved not to take their spiritual opportunities lightly. If you're, a, uh, if you're unsaved, or you're not certain where you are, resolve it soon. Because residing in an unbelieving uh, uh, mode, well, you'll be hardened. 
where you can't climb back over the wall, so to speak. And uh, while you have light, believe the light. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Wow. Because there is an adversary you have that's going to try to hide him from you. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And he goes on. So a judgment's coming. But you know, there's a, in that alarm by Isaiah, there's a hope. He said, how long? In other words, it's not, it's not going to be forever. See, that already, even though while, he, while Isaiah is talking about the judgment that's going to fall on them, he never loses sight that there's going to be at the end of the tunnel restoration. The way we might say it, there's light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Okay. And so, how long? That implies the eventual restoration of a remnant that's going to survive all this. ISV says pretty much the same thing. Then I ask, for how long, Lord? He replied, until the cities lie waste, without inhabitants, houses without people and land. It's, it's anticipating this judgment that's coming. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. And by the way, I just a footnote here, when the Assyrians do take over the northern kingdom, uh, they, one of the things the Assyrians did is transplant them to other parts of the empire. And, uh, and, and replace the people there from other, they commingled them. That was their policy. So they moved them far away and there was a great forsaking in this land, obviously. That, that's a prophecy that's forthcoming. But Isaiah continues, But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return and shall be eaten as a tile tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. So we apparently have a 10% protected group here of some kind. And the substance thereof is, is a stump, a pillar, and so forth. And that stump will relate to the stump of Jesse, and we'll get to that later in Isaiah. Uh, the ISV picks this up. It says, Until the Lord removes the people far away, and there are many empty places in the middle of the land, even though a tenth of the people remain in it, it will once again be burned like a terebinth or oak tree, the stump of which, though the tree has been felled, still contains the holy seed. So that's setting the, that's setting the, the, the seed, if you will, of a prophecy that's forthcoming. And you're going to see a prophecy in chapter 11 that will blow you away. Blow you away. And we'll come back to that later, of course. So the geop geopolitical attention, you need to understand what's going on here, is Assyria has been rising. They're, they're, the end of their prosperity under Uzziah, they're on a decline. While they're on a decline, Assyria is emerging as a major world empire. It looms large. On the, and that prompts the king of Syria, a guy by the name of Rezin, the king of Syria, we want to remember his name for a little bit, and Pekah, the king of Israel. When he says Israel here, he means the northern kingdom. The term Israel is being used for the, the, the adherence to Jeroboam I. After Solomon dies, there was a civil war, Rehoboam to the south, and I'm going to call it the southern kingdom. I'm not going to call it just... It calls itself the house of Judah, but it included Benjamin and Simeon among them, and the Levites joined them too later. The northern kingdom is not ten tribes, by the way. Many good commentators fall into that trap. The northern kingdom is at most eight. But that still, it's not the ten tribes. And they're not lost. That's another whole thing we'll get to another time. But the northern kingdom, which calls itself Israel, has a king by the name of Pekah. There's an attempt here to create an anti-Assyrian coalition. However, Ahaz refuses to join. Good for him. That's one of the few things he's done right. And uh, the two kings of the north now prepare to compel Ahaz. And so we're going to get now to Isaiah 7, okay? We're going to see an incident at the upper pool in the first nine verses. We're going to have a very key prophecy concerning the virgin birth in verses 10 through 17. And then we're going to see the devastation of the land in the later part of that chapter, okay? So let's just jump into chapter 7, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. In other words, Ahaz is now the king of Judah. That Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. They were trying to force Ahaz into their camp, okay? And uh, now Ramalia is a, uh, there's, a com there's going to be a confederacy here. And we're going to get into a guy by the name of Tabeel in a minute. And you won't, most people don't know who he is. And you're going to be fine. I'm going to tell you who he is. And you're going to know something most Bible scholars don't know. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, not a big deal, but you'll get a kick out of it. The ISV follows this pretty closely. During the reign of Jotham's son Ahaz, Uzziah's grandson, king of Judah, 
King Rezin of Aram, he, uh, the, the ISV likes to use the classical term for Syria, namely Aram, that's their forebears. The Rezin of Aram and Ramalia's son Pekah, the king of Israel, approached Jerusalem and waged war against it, but they could not mount an attack against it. Okay, so far so good. Verse 2, and it was told the house of David, now notice the address here, it's the house of David. Yes, it's Judah, but he's using a term here that's going to be very important before this chapter's over. And was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved and the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. <laughs> I like the wind, I like that. Now Ephraim is also being used as a euphemism for the northern kingdom. You see, just, just like we might use the term Hollywood or Los Angeles as an idiom for California, Sometimes you, you take the, it's called a synecdoche, taking the specific for the general, the general for the specific. The word Ephraim refers to a specific geographical territory, but it's the dominant one of the northern kingdom, so it's often used as a synonym for the whole northern kingdom. All through the scripture, you've got to be sensitive to that. And so, uh, okay. Ephraim and Israel are frequently used as collective nouns for the entire northern kingdom, established from Jeroboam's rebellion. Their capital was Samaria. That's also when they speak of Samaria, it's speaking of the capital, just like we speak of Tehran as the capital of Iran or whatever. See, the capital is Samaria in, in 1 Kings 21, if you want, and they were ultimately taken captive by Assyria in 722. That's forthcoming. They're going to be taken ultimately captive here. The ISV picks this up when it was reported to the house of David, Aram has joined forces with Ephraim. The heart of the people of Ahaz trembled like forest trees in a windstorm. Verse 3 Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Lord speaking now to Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Now, what is being, what they are doing, what the Lord's having them, both Isaiah and his son, confront King Ahaz. As he looks upon them, he sees two names. The, 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 uh, Isaiah means that Yod Yodivave is salvation. In other words, God is salvation. His son is the remnant shall return. That's what the name means. And Ahaz should know that. The remnant shall return is the idea. And by the way, it's, it's not unusual for the, the, uh, the prophet to speak of himself in the third person here. So there's two people standing before Ahaz. Yodivave is salvation. A remnant shall return. It's both an admonition and a threat. You with me? Okay. That's, that's what the Lord's setting up here. Sure, Ash, Jashub is, is, is the son's name, is, and that's going to come up in chapter 8. So the Lord told Isaiah, Go out and meet Ahaz, you and your son, Sheer Jashub, at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool that precedes the highway to the washerman's field. Okay, that's a modernization of that the terminology. But let's understand, it's very important for you to understand that Isaiah had two sons, and their names are relevant. Shir Jashub means a remnant shall return. It's a symbolical name for the son of Isaiah the prophet. The other guy is Maher Shalal Hashbaz. That's a handful to, you know, for a kid to go through school with. We're choosing up sides for sports. Uh, hey, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, you're on our team. And I, I'm sure they must have had nicknames or something. But anyway, what it means is swift as booty, speedy as prey. Swift as booty and speedy as prey. The symbolic name given, uh, 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 the prophetic indication that Damascus and Samaria would soon be plundered by the king of Assyria. That's going to be important later, by the way. We're just dealing with the first of the two in this passage, but I want you to be alert to the fact the second son will become relevant in a further prophecy later by Isaiah. And so, verse 4, And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Ramalia. So that's God talking to Isaiah about these two guys. And notice that he speaks of them as two tails of these smoking firebrand. A firebrand that's smoking is over, it's, it's gone, it's done. In other words, it's, it flared up, but it's not just smoking. It's, they're past. It's a, it's a degradatory thing. Neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands. You get the flavor? That's what God is telling uh, Isaiah here. Rezin and Pekah, that is the son of Ramalia, would not succeed in their coalition. That's really what he's telling him here. Okay. The ISV says, Tell him, be careful, be calm, don't be afraid, and don't lose heart because of these two smoldering stumps of torches. That is because of the fierce anger of Rezin from Aram and Ramalia's son. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Down to verse 5 and 6. Because Syria 
Ephraim and the son of Ramalia have taken evil counsel against thee. This is God telling Isaiah to tell that to the king. Evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, that, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. Now, it's fun to look through the commentators as they speculate, who is this guy Tabeel? And there's a little piece of information they don't have that I'm going to share with you, you might find interesting here in a minute. It could be a play on words, and that's what some commentators point out, because by only a slight alteration in the Hebrew, the Tabeel, the puppet king, can mean good for nothing. It can be an, ep- a dep- you know, an, an epithet, if you will. But there's more going on here that I want you to be aware of, but before we get into that, let's see what the ISV says. Aram, Ephraim, and Ramalia's son have plotted this evil against you. Let's go back. This is what they're saying. Let's go attack Judah. Let's terrorize it. Let's conquer it for ourselves. Then we'll install Tabeel's son as king. Oh, really? Well, who is Tabeel's son? You can find out if you know how to look. Okay. Let's take a look at this. The word Tabeel is an interesting word. It's the object of a lot of speculative conjectures by most commentators, but there is an encryption that reveals a subtlety here. One of the earliest forms of cryptography is a type of substitution called album in Hebrew. And students uh, that have have discovered this uh, are familiar with this. It's one of the oldest forms of encryption, and it's just a simple sliding alphabet, and I'll show you here in another diagram. And this particular one I'm going to show you is known as album, in which the alphabet, by the word alphabet is a Hebrew word, alphabet. Uh, we'll discover that linguistic manipulation in the form of encryption had its roots in the Hebrew culture. And uh, here's one of the reasons. Album, as it's called, is a case where you take the Hebrew letters, you got aleph through uh, uh, to, to the end, and, and when you get, what you do here is you take the, uh, the second half and slide it into the first half. You with me so far? And what you're going to do is you're going to substitute for any letter his, its correspondent on the other side. Instead of an aleph, you have a lamed. Instead of a beth, you have a, a mem. And that's what, if you pronounce A-L-B-M, album, you get the label they use for this particular form of encryption. In Isaiah 7, 6, you have the, uh, the word tabil. Remember, Hebrew goes from right to left. We've been through all that, all right? Okay. Well, if you take the, the mem, you, ch- you change that to a resh, okay? And you take the, uh, the next one, you take the beth, and you get a mem. And you take the uh, aleph, and you subtract that with an l, and you take the uh, l, which is next, and uh, make that an aleph. And that turns out to spell the name Ramalia. And what this tells you is that the son of Ramalia was the one they were going to put in as the puppet king. No surprise when you look at the characters involved, but it's tucked away in encryption. Now, the, this little cryptographic insight reveals the subtlety of the conspiracy. The father of the man that res, of Rez in Damascus and Pekah of Israel planned to place on the throne of Judah was the puppet king was, of course, Pekah. Okay, that's all it means to. Now, If you are a student of cryptography, this is known as just a historical audit. There's a couple of these in the Bible. I'll show you another one here in a minute. I'll show you two here in a minute. Um, But the point is, if you're a student of cryptography, they're just historical novelties that we have manipulation of this kind in the Bible. It's kind of a surprise to many people. If you have a supernatural perspective of the role of the biblical text, the discovery that there are encryptions in the Bible opens up a whole new set of insights. If you arm, you include that with the Holy Spirit, don't be surprised to see things that other people have missed. So we shouldn't be surprised by that. In fact, one of the things you discover is that the early, the courts in Europe had, as they, as they themselves got more and more in need of encryption skills, they had on their staff Jewish rabbis that knew how to do these kinds of things. And you'll discover that the history of encryption sophistication parallels the involvement of the Hebrew sages, these brilliant, brilliant minds, in the courts of Europe, developing the kinds of encryptions that lead through the whole science of cryptography. It has its roots there. It's kind of interesting. But there's an, and so this is from the Midrash Rabbah, by the way. But there's another form of Hebrew substitution called Atbash, and that's where you take the second half of the alphabet and reverse it. 
so that the it starts at the aleph on the upper left and it ends with the tau and the uh, on the uh, on the bottom. You follow me here? And so th- if you try to pronounce this, you got a t b s atbash, if you will. So it's got a different label for this particular form of substitution. And obviously, in, well, in Jeremiah 25 and also 51, you find there Shishak shows up and people don't know what that is. If you read your commentaries, they, they can tell from context it has something to do with Babylon, a suburb or something. No, it turns out that's an encryption of Babel in using Atbash. If you go to Jeremiah 51, you have Leb Kamai in, 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 in that verse, and that turns out to be a reference to the Kashtim or the Chaldeans, okay? The heart of my enemy are, is the Chaldeans. So you, you can learn. This is one case where you get a little bit of insights for what's really going on. But the, the amazing thing for, to us, we're primarily interested in just skills here, to realize that there are encryptions in the scripture. One of the simplest ones is a thing called equidistant letter sequences. And we're going to take a look at that when we get to Isaiah 53 for some big surprises. So the handwriting on the wall in Daniel is another example of this. This is what he apparently saw on the wall and blew up there. But if you, tr- if you recognize that that is Atbash, uh, then it turns out to spell many, many, meaning numbered, reckoned, your number is up in other words. Tekel, which means weighed, you're fra- weighed in the balances and fra- heart warning. And Perez, which means broken or divided. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. In fact, if you take Perez and assume a different set of vowels instead of easy a, an A sound, that happens to be the name of the Persians, which are taking over. This, all, this is the whole drama taking place in Daniel 5. What's myster- uh, very mysterious about the whole episode in Daniel 5 is why couldn't they read what's on the wall? In the middle of this big party, there's this handwriting on the wall, and no one could figure it out. And the queen, mother, the queen mother, he says, Reminds that there was a guy in the, in the previous administration, a guy by the name of Daniel, that could they call Daniel out of retirement, and he's able to read it. The mystery among scholars is why couldn't they read it? The Talmud says, well, it's written vertically and backwards, and that, I don't think that's the problem. They could have solved that pretty easily. No, the the the, the other tradition has root sources that it was an atbash, and that's why he could read it. And so that gets into the Magi and a bunch of other things too. But that's a, there's, a, there's an, a book that's very studied called Daniel, but there's even in it some things many people haven't penetrated yet. We, we could, I, I urge you to take a look at that sometime if you get the chance. Uh, you'll get confused when you read your King James because Perez is rendered Eupharsin. Well, the U is, an, is, a, connect, is, an, is a, a connective. And uh, the uh, Farzan is the plural of Perez in Aramaic, so that the, tra- the transliteration of it in the King James is confusing. It's just taking the word Perez and making it a plural is all it boils down to. But let's move. So cryptography. The royal courts of Europe exploited Hebrew sages for their, in their cryptographic chambers because of the unique manipulation skills. There's a whole history of this that you can get into if you want to get into it. We have a book on that called Cosmic Codes, Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity, where we have some chapters, some tutorial chapters in the front of that book to help you through some of this background. Most people writing in this area have no cryptographic background. That's one reason our book has gotten some, um, uh, a sort of a foundational book in this, in, in this pursuit. But there's another form, it's a very terrible form of encryption, but it's a very provocative form of authentication called equidistant letter sequences. We are now at verse 7. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither, speaking of the coalition, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. So everything I've told you here is irrelevant because it didn't, take, it didn't win. Okay, so this is just, these are just footnotes. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. So there's a prediction, a very specific prediction. And it's a, there's an ad, adversative here called but. And uh, it, within 65 years, Esarhaddon, a successor in the Assyrian Empire, will replace the colonists ending the national existence of Ephraim. And that's in 2 Kings 17 and Ezra 4 and so forth. So it is within 65 years that Ephraim is not only made captive, it's eliminated. And that's what he's saying here. They're not a people as a cohesive group. The ISV says, but this is what the Lord God has to say. It won't take place. It never happened. 
I mean, it won't happen. It won't ever happen. Because Aram's head is Damascus and Rezin is its king, and then within 65 years Ephraim will be shattered as a people, and indeed it was. Verse 9, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son. If he will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. In other words, you won't believe. If, if you will not believe, you will not endure, is what it really, in effect, says. The, the ISV says, furthermore, Ephraim's head is Samaria, and Ramalia's son is its king. If all of you don't keep on believing, you'll never remain loyal. What confuses me the way they phrased it, but that's okay. Ahab is a loser, bad guy. Now, he didn't get into the coalition, good for him, but he did a lot of other things. He worshipped Moloch in 2 Kings 16. That's the brash thing that they put their babies in, infant, infant uh, all that anyway. Attempt to enlist the help of the Syrian gods in 2 Chronicles 28. He summoned the aid of Assyria to come to his aid. And that was a mistake. And incidentally, he had a replica of the Assyrian field altar in Damascus set up in the Templar in Jerusalem. So Ahaz, from God's point of view, he is, he is uh, corrupt here. And uh, so, now some of these events may have followed the events of Isaiah 7. Isaiah is very, uh, Ahaz was very weak, duly impressed with the might of Assyria. He had little faith in Yorivave, as, and as king of Judah, he falls far short of the ideal. So he's one of the losers. He's not as big a loser as Manasseh was that follows Hezekiah. He was really bad news. That's another story we'll get to. Well, the head of Assyria at this time is Tiglath-Pileser. And he was summoned by Ahaz, of course. And in about 734, he destroyed the Rezin Pekka coalition, indeed. And he went further south and punished Philistia, especially Gaza. And he penetrated even to the borders of, of Egypt. So Assyria is on the rise under Tiglath-Pileser. The following year, he thoroughly devastated the Galilee and Transjordan. Pekah was murdered by Hosea, another guy that uh, succeeded him. And then the following year, Damascus itself was ravaged. And uh, so anyway, we get to verse 10, uh, 7, 10 here. Moreover, the Lord, now in that background, get the point, you got Ahaz who's in, he's not in faith. He's, he's a loser here from God's point of view. Moreover, the Lord spake again to Ahaz saying, Notice this challenge that God gives Ahaz. He says, ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Wow, what a challenge by God to Ahaz. And he turns him down. He won't play. He doesn't want any part of this. That's, a, that's really the depth of unbelief. Can you imagine God giving you that challenge? Ask thee a sign. Something really wild, something really dramatic. You with me? Get the sense. You need to get the context here. It's very, very important for what's coming. Ask me a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. And, uh, so this, this, and so the ISV picks this up. Later on, the Lord spake again to Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol and as high as heaven above. Well, that's, uh, that's quite a reach, okay? And notice what Ahaz's response to this is. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Now that uh, pseudo-pious sound is simply very stubborn unbelief. It is not simply apply applying Deuteronomy 6.16, which says you shouldn't tempt the Lord. No, the Lord is inviting you here. This a different deal. Now Isaiah is going to cut through the sham and the pretense. The, the, thy God of verse 11 will become my God in verse 13. It was thy, thy God gives him the thing, and now here Isaiah shifts the pronoun because he, he will speak of my God. It isn't your God. That isn't your God we're talking about. I'll talk about my God. And he said, hear me now. And notice he changes the addressee here. Hear me now, O house of David. See, Ahaz the king passed. He, he, wasn't, he didn't want to play. All right. As he says, Hear me now, O house of David. And he's speaking for God here. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? Interesting change of pronoun here. It was thy God in the previous verse. Now it's my God. See, it's refocused. It, Isaiah's talking by my God, and he's dealing with the house of David, not he has anymore. Okay. Hear me now, O house of David. Important address here. And so, and by the way, because he's addressing this this way, 
That explains why Mary in, in Luke 1 was so quick to receive the Gabriel's announcement. She's not surprised because there's a promise that is being fulfilled there to the house of David. And that's an interesting insight in my mind. Anyway, the ISV says, A has applied, I won't ask, I won't put the Lord to the test. In reply, the Lord announced, please listen, you household of David. Is it such a minor thing for you to try the patience of men? Must you also try the patience of my God? Well, that's okay. I like the King James better myself. But this is the real, this is the verse. It's one of my favorite in the Bible. Therefore, the Lord himself will, shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And uh, a virgin. This is a place where the King James has an error. It's not a virgin, it's the virgin. It's a definite article there, which is em em more emphatic. And the NASB and the other modern translations usually pick up on that. And so the word in the Hebrew there, in the Masoretic, is Alma, which means a virgin, a young woman, an untouched Unmarried woman is what the word means. And you find that way in Genesis 24, 43, Exodus 2, 8, and also Song of Songs, first chapter, verse 3. And there's other places, but those are the key ones. You can get those in your notebook. The, uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, done three centuries before Christ's birth, um, in the, the, the Septuagint, and, and thus it's in the New Testament, in the Greek, it's Parthenos, which is a, a Parthenos, which is a virgin. Clearly, the Greek is very precise and very clear, and all the competent scholars agree. There's no, there's no really debate about that. The ISV read, <coughs> treats it this way: Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Watch, the virgin will be conceiving a child and will give birth to a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel. So they come through very clearly. The virgin birth. The Lord himself will give you a sign. This is on God's initiative. It's divinely given. And the you there is in the plural. In other words, addressed to the whole house of David, not just to Ahaz or who happened to be standing by. And it is intended to be a miraculous a sign. That's what verse 11 was calling for. And it's concerned with the continuation of the house of David for a reason I'll come to in a minute. And I want to emphasize it's the virgin. There's a definite article there that the King James happens to miss, unfortunately. And Emmanuel, God with us, the incarnation. But there's a seventh reason. Uh, well, he also, I should say, he's truly human. In other words, just like other children, he's a real human being. All the different cults try to attack Christ either in terms of his deity or in terms of his humanity. No, both are critical, both are there, both are required for his mission. As, the, the, as is profiled in the book of Ruth, but is climaxed in Revelation chapter 5. And uh, leave that to you to dig out. Now, this fulfills, as I say, the promise in the Garden of Eden, uh, the seed of the woman that, uh, that uh, God calls forth there in, in uh, Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman in Revelation 12. In Revelation 12, we have one of these chapters that's sort of a parenthesis, a summary. But in there, too, Israel is pictured as a woman giving birth to the man-child. That's the, the Redeemer. And there again. And the, the Goel, the kinsman Redeemer, that whole concept is profiled for you in the book of Ruth, which of course foreshadows, and thus is a requirement really to understand, Revelation 5. And, uh, and then of course, this also, another item that may surprise many, is that it anticipates the blood curse on the royal seed after Jeconiah. And uh, we might take a quick look at that. In Jeremiah 22.30, you find a very interesting verse. See, by then, the, the, even the, the kings of the southern kingdom go from bad to worse. The northern kingdom went, was taken out by the Assyrians about a century later. The, by then, the southern uh, kingdom was also in, in, uh, going downhill. So much so that God finally uh, pronounces a blood curse on, the, on Jeconiah. In Jeremiah 22, 30, it says, Thus saith the Lord, write this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. And I, I always uh, intrigued by this because I can't help but uh, suspect that in the councils of Satan, they probably threw a party. 
because I'm sure they thought, boy, God did it to himself this time, because they knew that uh, the uh, Messiah had to be from the line of David, and now God has pronounced a blood curse on that very line. And as they're celebrating, I always visualize God turning to the angels and saying, watch this one. And uh, so, uh, what, what, what's the answer here? Well, uh, by the way, Je- Jeconiah is also called Jehoiachin, if you're following that in the Old Testament there. When you get into the genealogies, of course, Luke, uh, being interested in his humanity, starts with Adam, the first man, and goes down through, and when he comes to Abraham on, both Matthew and uh, uh, Luke agree between Abraham and David. Matthew starts with the first Jew at Abraham and <clears throat> brings you the line of David. Okay. And uh, when you get down to the uh, to David, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David, incidentally are encrypted in Genesis 38. But let's move on here. When you get to the house of David, Matthew being Jewish, goes down through the first surviving son of uh, David, it's namely Solomon. It goes down through Solomon, then to Jehoiakim, right on down to Joseph. And so Joseph is the legal father of, De- of uh, Jesus, but he's not the bloodline. He doesn't carry the blood curse of Jeconiah, interestingly enough. Now, Luke, t- being interested in humanity, goes down a different path. When he gets to David, he doesn't go down through Solomon. He goes to the second surviving son of Bathsheba, a guy by the name of Nathan. And he tracks it down to Mary, to Heli, which Mary. And uh, so what you need to understand, Joseph was the son-in-law of Heli. And uh, this, is, this is all a, a fulfillment of the daughters of Zelophehad. I'll show you that in a minute here. Uh, we have a, in the Torah, when uh, Moses was dealing with inheritance, uh, Zelophehad comes to him and says, I only have five daughters. What's, what, what am I to do? Moses goes to the Lord. The Lord says, make an exception. So he does. And that's requested and, 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 uh, of Moses in Numbers 27, the first 11 verses. Later on, 40 years later, when uh, they're in the land under Joshua, and uh, by then uh, uh, these f- f- uh, five daughters come to Joshua and say, check it out, we have an exception. And he checks it out, and they do. In Joshua 17, it's recorded that this exception that God had Moses put in the Torah is that if a man had no sons that the inheritance could pass through the da- to a son-in-law if she married within the tribe. And so that exception for the daughter of Zelophehad is in the... In, and the way they uh, implemented that is that if that was the case, there were no sons, the father of the bride could adopt her husband as a son and set up the inheritance. And that's uh, done in Ezra, Nehemiah, and it's recorded several times in the scripture. And so... What's interesting, I think it was C.I. Schofield, not in his Bible, but in some of his other writings, he was the first to recognize that the daughters, that this whole exception in Torah is essential for the lineage of Christ. It, it, it uh, ties the lineage of Christ for the house and, and uh, uh, line of David. See, Joseph, if you look at Luke 3.23 carefully in the Greek, it says Joseph was the son-in-law of Heli. Nomitso means reckoned as by law. We would use the term a son-in-law, but that would... But in uh, any case, that's all there. You can check it out. And so that, that's another reason for the virgin birth, to get around this curse on Jeconiah. And if you go through the genealogy in Matthew 1, get down to verse 16, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. See, Matthew uh, slips around that, of course, right there. And uh, so you'll notice there's some other people that are similar they may be the same guys, they may be different guys with the same name, uh, scholars are not sure, but that may have also transpired because of this son-in-law relationship. And so, uh, but Matthew clarifies this, now the birth of Christ was this wise, when, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away, but, how good, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take thee unto thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save the people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, meaning Isaiah, by the way, the passage we just looked at. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. 
Now all this talk, you'll run into some of the literature, commentary, so forth, about the Alma and Bethula and all the, the Hebrew word, is really irrelevant. It happens to be wrong, by the way, because Alma does mean a virgin. But the point is, it doesn't matter. Matthew, in the Greek, nails this. So that should end the textual arguments that uh, are, are in certain circles. No, this is very clear, unequivocal. The virgin birth is a essential doctrine to all of us. We need to understand that. And so, uh, quoting from the Septuagint, the, the, the very precise Greek. Then it goes on in, in uh, verse 15, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse evil and choose the good. And uh, that's, a, a rel- that's a, an allusion to the period of infancy, two to three years. And it was made the measure of time that Judah uh, also will be in, the, in danger from her two enemies. But this is a plainness and simplicity in life also, which the young Emmanuel which should be brought up. And that's in contrast, by the way, to what we read about his, his unhappy childhood, which we had a glimpse of in Psalm 69. Check it out sometime from verses 7 to 12 in Psalm 69, one of the most quoted Psalms in the New Testament for other reasons, but it also gives us a glimpse into that early family life as the young child was growing up in Nazareth. And, uh, but here it's just alluding to a two or three year period and uh, that he'll eat cheese and honey, that he knows enough to reject what's wrong and choose the right. The ISV picks up on that theme of it there pretty well. Because the next verse is, For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land which thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. And that's exactly what happened, incidentally. That within two or three years, both the kings that are the ad- Rezin and Pekah are both history. Okay. And the period that's involved is not used, it doesn't exceed two or three years. And that suggests the only remaining duration of those two kings that are their problem, okay? And that's the ISV seems to pick that up. However, before the youth knows enough to reject what's wrong and choose what's right, the land whose two kings you dread will be devastated, and indeed it was. So that's actually a, a, a rather eloquent kind of prophecy, if you will. Verse 17, the Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people, upon thy father's house, days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And so you've got to be careful what you pray for. Ahaz wanted the Assyrians to get in the act. Well, they sure did. They took the whole northern kingdom captive, see. Now, he's, a, he's southern kingdom, that's fine, but that's a, the Babylon's coming for them later. But Ahaz had pinned his hopes on Assyria, and Assyria is what he got, so to speak. And the impending invasion is predicted from verse 17 uh, on to the end here. And uh, so, the Lord will bring to you, to your people and your ancestors' house, such a time as was never since, since Ephraim broke away from Judah. The king of Assyria will indeed come. And so, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And as he says pretty much the same thing, at that time the Lord will call for flies that will come from far away from the headwaters of Egypt's rivers and for the bees that are in the land of Assyria. And they shall come and they shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. Now as he says, they will come and settle in the deep ravines and the rocky crevices and in all the thorn bushes and all the pastures. Devastation, in other words. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river by the king of Assyria, the head, the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. And the hair of the feet, by the way, some commentators says is a euphemism for pubic hair, but I'm not going to get into that. Let's get one here. Ahaz sent gifts to tiglath pileser the king of Assyria, to hire him to come and deliver him from Syria and Israel. So tiglath pileser takes on Damascus and reason two years after this prophecy, which is an interesting fulfillment. ISV says that that day the Lord will hire a barber to come from beyond the Euphrates River, that is the king of Assyria, and he will shave your heads, your leg hair, and your beards too. And I'll leave the other thing alone right now. We'll move on, verse 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep, and it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, he shall eat butter, for butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land. And... Uh, at that time, man will keep alive, according to the ISV, a heifer and two sheep because of the abundance of milk that they give. He will have cheese to eat since whosoever remains in the land will be eating cheese and honey. In other words, there isn't any real farming going on here, apparently. It shall come to pass on that day that every place that shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silverlings, it shall even be for briars and thorns. 
As he says, every place where once there was a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, only briars and thorns will grow. See, that's bad news, in other words. With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns, and all the hills that shall be digged with the mattock shall, shall not come thither for fear of briars and thorns. But it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. And so people come armed with bows and arrows, because the entire land will be nothing but briars and thorns. And as for the hills that used to be cultivated with a hoe, you won't go there because you'll fear iron briars and thorns. Nevertheless, those hills will be reserved as a pasture where cattle will feed and sheep will graze. And so, so the broader relevance here, just to highlight this, God had called a special people to represent him. They'd become apostate and failed. The enemies of God are represented by Assyria in this case and Babylon later. God's judgment and ultimate restoration are depicted and surprisingly relevant to our people today as my premise. I want you to test that as we go forward. And as I told you before, we are in session one. For the next session, I want you to read Isaiah chapter 8 through 11. Some of those are very short, so it's not as bad as it may sound at first. But as you do that, I want you to search the, the passage for a specific prophecy directed to you and me at this time right now. I'll let you find that on your own as we go forward. And with that, let's have a word of prayer.